president has declared a national emergency, which seeks to divert $8 billion towards the building of a US-Mexico border wall. Thank you for taking a few minutes to jump in on a very important topic with me here. I wanted to do this video because there's a lot of biased information out there and I wanted to break this down from a purely legal and analytical standpoint. What you probably don't know if you're watching our channel for the first time or if you just casually watch the channel is that I am also a lawyer in the state of California. I passed the bar exam on my first try and I thought this was a great opportunity to speak to you directly about some of the legal ramifications that are inherent here, what it means for the United States, the United States Constitution, and ultimately what it means for you. If you guys are wondering about any of the references, they're all in the description below. So let's get started. So as you may know, the president has declared a national emergency which seeks to divert $8 billion away from areas previously allocated by Congress to build a US-Mexico border wall. This is very important for a lot of reasons. Let's get into it. As you probably heard, the US government just reopened after the longest shutdown in its history of 35 days. Now, why was it shut down? Well, quite frankly, because Congress couldn't agree on a budget bill that they knew the president would sign. Under Article 1 of the Constitution, Congress has the power of the purse, which basically means they have the power to control the money of the United States of America. Now, that's their department. That's their branch of government. However, they can't pass a budget bill or a law solely on their own. The balance of powers require that the president sign off on a bill or a budget in order for it to become law. So here's where this really starts to matter. While the president signed off on the budget, that budget didn't include the $8 billion of funding that he wanted to build the US-Mexico border wall. So what is he to do? If he really wants to make this happen, he either has to quit and go on, or if you're an unorthodox guy, you can invoke your national emergency powers. What is required exactly for a president to be able to declare a national emergency, and what is it? First and foremost, a national emergency is a power that a president can use to basically give them extra power in a moment of crisis. Way back in 1911, Woodrow Wilson was the first one to declare a national emergency. And after him, presidents really liked it. They started declaring more of them. FDR declared a bunch of them. The problem was that at no point during these declarations did the president cite relevant statutes, which gave them the authority to declare an emergency. They didn't cite the scope or for how long an emergency was supposed to be in effect. So it started to get into unfettered power territory. And in 1976, Congress passed the National Emergencies Act, which limits the authority from which a president can declare an emergency to about 135 statutes. It also requires that if a president is to declare an emergency, he must cite one of those statutes as the basis for his power. On February 15th, the president declared his construction authority from one of these statutes, specifically 10 U.S. USC 2808A. I have the statute right here. I'm gonna read it to you with my handy dandy piece of paper. In the event of a declaration by the president of a national emergency that requires the use of the armed forces, the Secretary of Defense may undertake and authorize military construction projects not otherwise authorized by law, which are necessary to support such use of the armed forces. That's what the president is basing his authority off of. What does that mean? Well, number one, you need the armed forces to be at the border in order for this to be even relevant. Well, that's true, the armed forces are at the border. Secondarily, the construction aspect of the statute is supposed to be in support of the purpose for which the armed forces are there. So given what the president is citing for his national emergency authority here, the only question becomes whether his declaration can be seen as legitimate within the bounds of this statute. Now there's nothing like free market advertising to get you into the political mindset. And God bless America because today's episode is brought to you by Squarespace. That's right, they have an all-in-one platform. So whether you're looking to create a website or claim a domain or build an online store, or market a brand, they got you covered. They have beautiful award-winning designer templates and 24-7 award-winning customer service. I mean, who doesn't like to speak to somebody on the phone when you call in? If only politics were that easy. It's also never been easier to do an online store. If you need to keep track of inventory or if you got Nico running for president in 2020 and you need to keep track of all the shirts that you sell, Squarespace can help you out. Was that an announcement? Yeah, Nico just announced. <laughs> so head on over to squarespace.com to get started on your free trial today. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash corridor crew and get 10% off your first purchase. Now, back to that national emergency. 
Now, as you may know, multiple states have filed suit in direct opposition to this emergency declaration, so it will inevitably go to law. The court will need to look at two things. Number one, they will first need to ask whether or not the national emergency required the use of the armed forces. And number two, whether the building of a border wall is necessary to support the use of the armed forces. They will also look at precedent. This construction authority has been used two other times by both Bush presidents, with George W. Bush, it was after the attacks of 9-11, and we sent troops all over the world, and the construction authority was necessary to support those troops as they went about the global war on terror. In addition, George H.W. Bush cited this authority when Kuwait was first invaded by Iraq, and we needed to intervene and create infrastructure for our military so that we could stop that from happening. Now, the courts could very well rule in favor of the Trump administration here. That wouldn't surprise me at all. In general, the courts defer to the president when it comes to authority as the commander-in-chief. But even if the president is able to do this, just because he can do something, we need to ask ourselves whether or not it's the right thing to do. Here's what I mean. We're dealing with a situation where multiple other departments of the executive branch, the same branch as the president, such as Customs and Border Protection and the Department of Homeland Security, their data shows that since 2000, captures at the border have all gone down, while enforcement of the border has all gone up. That means that border security is working. There is no real way to sugarcoat that because there is no other data that supports his opinion as strongly as he has his opinion. It's completely unprecedented in that sense. Unfortunately for all of us, there is very little direction under the National Emergencies Act, which says how much of an emergency something actually needs to be for the use of an emergency declaration to be considered legitimate. Regardless of all that, the main problem is that this politicizes the national emergency power. That's the greatest threat to the United States here and to the Constitution. Food for thought. Thanks for spending a couple minutes here with us at Corridor Digital, and uh, I'd love to hear what your guys' opinion is on this. Leave a comment below. I'll definitely be taking a look and scrolling through, responding back. Keep it civil. Please, please keep it civil. That is the one thing that we need more of. Thanks for watching. Hey, Sam. Hey, how's it going? Guess what? I just hit submit on our Amazon storefront page for top 10 games you can play in your head by yourself. That means on Saturday, March 2nd, this book is finally going to be live and ready to purchase. I'm super excited about it. We've been working on this for almost five years and it's it's a monumental occasion for me because I've never released a book. We've never done anything like this. I've been reading the subreddit, r slash corridor, just asking, what's the deal with this book? I can't find anything about it online. I, what is going on? How do you play these games? And trust me, we, we had a lot of the same questions when we first discovered these books. Uh, actually, I brought from my house uh, three, the very first three volumes that we actually found in uh, 2014. It's a, it's a really interesting story because when we first found these things, like we didn't even know what we were getting into, you know, but after starting to read them, like we noticed that there was like, they were subtly influencing kind of like all the videos that we were making. Let's see, uh, volume six has some great games in it. Uh, small, Tiny Guns was kind of influenced by small, a game, a game about shrinking things down and shrinking yourself down. The titles are super rudimentary and maybe the author didn't want to like color your experience. Uh, zombies was good because actually there was a zombie bullfighting moment. Airplane Ride was really, really incredible because uh, when you start simulating flying in your mind, you get some really great ideas for drone videos. Drone Star Wars kind of ended up stemming from that. Oh, Fight City. Tactical Reloads was uh, kind of influenced from that. Uh, this like, seedy underbelly of police and criminals kind of end up getting some really great weapon fighting and reloading abilities in it. Jungle, primitive technology. Well, jungle is basically you are trapped in the jungle and and you've got nothing to live for, and you've got nothing except the skin on your back, and you have to survive. Army? Was it Army? Um, so not the second tank video with the one with Miwa, but the, f the first tank video I f we filmed with Danny, where I'm trying to sell him a tank. Army was a huge part of that. If you think you're getting into like a war zone thing, it really focuses on kind of more the budgetary aspects and the management parts of the army that you don't normally think about. And what do we got here? Volume 8. Ooh, I remember this one. Time Machine. I was reading this one before we shot Lifeline, and it really helped me get in that headspace of just understanding how time travel works, and really kind of answers the question of when someone is time traveling from the past to the future, where are they in between? If you play the game Time Machine, you will, you will quickly find that out. I still haven't played Dancing, 
It's, it's pretty incredible. It's just a little bit of taste of actually what's been kind of going on behind the scenes here at Quarter Digital over the last few years. Yeah, I mean, honestly, we are just really excited to finally start to share this. We didn't realize that until we started giving these copies and lending them around the studio. Uh, how much of an impact do you really have on everyone's lives? I, I know Nick and Jake have both gotten really into it to the point where they've actually come to the studio with stories they had in their dreams of these games. Actually, uh, they were so good that we wrote them in the testimonials section at the end of this book. It's a really great little read after you're done playing the games. Uh, you definitely don't want to read them before you play, or else it kind of taints the experience.